All right, welcome to our next presentation in our series, How Austrian Economics Impacted My Life. And we're just, I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, the sponsor of this series. And we are just really honored to have one of the premier Austrian economists in the world uh, presenting tonight. Let me just give you some highlights of his life. He got his BA degree at Grove City College under Hans Senholz. Those of you that have been longtime Austrian economists or involved in this area know who Hans is, and he's been mentioned in previous talks in this series. Uh, Pete got his MA and his PhD in economics at George Mason. He's taught at several institutions, including New York University, where the famed Austrian economist Israel Kersner taught. And of course, you all have heard that name in previous presentations here. Uh, he's also been a faculty fellow at the Charles University, Georgetown University, American Institute for Political and Economic Studies in Prague, and a visiting professor at the Hoover Institution on War, Revolution, and Peace at Stanford University. In 2012, he was awarded a doctorate honoris causa in social sciences from University Francisco Marroquin in Guatemala. He's the vice president for research at the Mercatus Center, director of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics. He's the editor of George Mason University's Review of Austrian Economics, and he has served as president and vice president of the Mont Pelerin Society. He's the author of at least 10 books and the editor of at least 13 books or so. He is currently professor of economics and, uh, and, philo of, and philosophy at George Mason University. And of course, you all know that I've mentioned how George Mason has most likely the finest economics uh, department in the country, where he is the B he's also the BB&T professor for the study of capitalism and the vice president for research and director at the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Studies in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center, which is located there at GMU. Pete, I can't tell you what an honor it is to have you join us. Thank you for taking the time to do so, and take it away. Uh so, Bumper, I'm thrilled to be here and to have an opportunity to talk to your uh, group. Um, I don't mind questions as I go through. If people would like to have more of a dialogue than anything, they should just, you know, sort of jump in or however we are doing that. Um, but uh, I will begin at the beginning. <laughs> well, let, let me let me interrupt you for a second yeah. then. I mean, if you really mean that, then I think what we're going to have to do if somebody really wants to uh, ask a question in the middle of your talk, I think the best thing to do is raise your hand, or if you want your question to be answered at the end, put it in the chat. Okay. So I think that's the best way to handle it. Okay, great. However, it is the best way to facilitate a conversation between us. Um, so I'm going to begin at the beginning, which is that I wasn't much of a student in high school or even in college. Um, however, the summer before I attended Grove City College, Here's my Grove City uh, banner that I keep with me at all times. Uh, before I attended Grove City College, I worked a job digging pools. It was the summer of 1979, and there was long gas lines, as anyone who lived through that uh, will remember. And my experience was extremely unpleasant uh, doing, uh, you know, involved with that. Um, I can explain that for another day. Um, but I, I I go to Grove City, um, and uh, my professor, Hans Senholtz, uh, explained why it is that we were experiencing these gas lines and what was going on in the U.S. economy. And I went from a student who was totally uninterested to someone who was now completely, uh, you know, hooked and wanted to learn more and more and more. And Senholtz provided my guide for doing that. I took all the classes I could take with Dr. Senholtz. Um, I read all the recommendations that he gave of the books. Um, it also happened to be a period of time when there was a great explosion of, of economic books that were interesting. It happens in the mid 70s, late 70s. There, you know, for example, Walter Block's book, Defending the Undefendables. Um, there was also um, uh, a book by Douglas North on the economics of uh, abortion, baseball, and weed. Uh, people were trying to explore economics in all avenues of life. Um, so it seemed like this the economics could open up everything. And at the same time, Milton Friedman's Free to Choose was published. 
um, that went along with a PBS series. Um, also, Mises is Socialism was published by uh, Liberty Fund and now a uh, cheap paperback. Uh, the Theory of Money and Credit was uh, published again by Liberty Fund. Mises' book, uh, 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 again, you know, available at that time. And Senholtz had us also read Capital and Interest by Bambavrik, which he was the translator of. So that was like a core text in our in our in our uh, uh, education, as was, of course, Mises is Human Action. And I should say also Murray Rothbard's Man, Economy and State. So by the time I was a sophomore or junior in college, um, Senholtz asked me to join in with his graduate seminar. Um, he had uh, students from uh, outside the United States, mainly from Argentina, but he had some French students as well. And uh, some, uh, um, I'm trying to think of where else students came from. Anyway, he had a relationship with a thing called the International College. And so students could come to Grove City and write a thesis and get a PhD. Um, I, in fact, attended the PhD thesis defense of uh, Juan Carlos Kechanovsky, who uh, was a major uh, player in uh, Buenos Aires uh, for free market ideas um, and unfortunately just recently passed away. Um, but So I was the only undergraduate that was asked to join the, uh, the graduate seminar and I spent my last year and a half um, at Grove City attending the, the graduate seminar that Senholtz ran. And that introduced me to um, thinking about economics in a more not student- like undergraduate student way, but like in a real scholarly way, like I was going to try to be not only a consumer of economics, but someone who may one day write books and, and whatnot. Um, it also was the case that I had a great teacher at Grove City uh, named Reed Davis, um, who taught a, a, a core course in philosophy and religion. And he introduced me to the writings of Michael Polanyi. So at the same time that I was being introduced to the writings of Mises and Hayek and Rothbard and Kersner, uh, let alone Menger and Bambavrik and Senholtz, of course, um, I was also being introduced to the work of Michael Polanyi. And so this had a huge impact on me because it related to how we study the human sciences. One of the first books of Polanyi that I read was called The Study of Man um, and also Polanyi's role in science in a free society, which you know, really sort of excited me. And so I pretty much, I was an econ philosophy major and I decided that I was going to, you know, now pursue a sort of academic life. Now, it didn't come to me right away because I took some time out between undergraduate school and graduate school. I was working a job back in New Jersey. I got married. Um, and uh, then, you know, my wife, Rosemary and I, we moved to uh, you know, Virginia to attend George Mason University. A large part of that was influenced by, you know, in, in, in Bumper's crowd here, there'll be people who know who Leonard Reed is and who Bettina B.N. Graves. As an undergraduate, Senholtz had us go to fee. I met Bettina B.N. Graves and Leonard Reed. Both of them took a liking to me and they encouraged me in my studies um, and, and tried to, uh, you know, get me to um, sort of study more and more. And, uh, and Leonard Reed, in fact, sent me uh, his book, Anything That's Peaceful, uh, with a little inscription that told me that, you know, the, the liberty movement kind of needed intellectuals like me, so I should go and become an intellectual. Uh, Bettina Bien Graves gave me a lot of advice about what graduate school, of course, they were steering everyone more or less towards NYU. But of course, there was a new Mises Institute that was just being established in Auburn. And there was the PhD program being formed at George Mason University. And um, and, and Walter Grinder, who's also a, a Grove City graduate, he was the one who alerted me to what was going on at George Mason uh, University. And also I um, had read Don Lavoy, who later became my professor at George Mason University, his uh, special issue in the journal Libertarian Studies on the socialist calculation debate. And I was very influenced by what Lavoy had to say there. And so after a year of, you know, working, I applied and, and got accepted into the graduate school at George Mason University. And I was able to start thinking about what are the puzzles uh, that intrigue me. Um, 
And the number one puzzle that intrigued me was how markets actually work and how you get social cooperation without central command. So I was very interested in self-governing systems, what Rothbard called anarcho-capitalism. I wanted to explore those kind of ideas, but I also wanted to study the opposite, which was the centrally planned economies and what was wrong with them. And, uh, and that was how I started you know, my, my work when I, when I first sort of developed as an academic, I was writing books on the Soviet Union and, and uh, uh, its history, its operation, its collapse, its recovery that pretty much dominated, uh, you know, most of my intellectual life in the beginning of my career. Um, but the, the central puzzle was how markets actually work. How do markets work to coordinate uh, the vast majority of uh, uh, the vast uh, uh, expanse of individuals that are of great social distance to one another. Um, you know, so the I pencil story or what Adam Smith called the I woolen coat um, and, and whatnot. I should point out that, uh, you know, Senholtz was more a public intellectual and he was also more directed towards fighting the policy battle. Um, and so his lectures were always filled with commentary on politics of the day. You know what? Not like not politics in the sense of who to vote for, but what are the policies? What are the monetary policies being followed? What are the you know wage labor policies being followed? What are the fiscal policies? He published books while I was in in uh, school. There he, there's a famous book called The Age of Inflation, um, but he he was publishing books on debts and deficits. He was publishing books on the labor market and restrictions on labor. He was publishing, uh, you know, uh, uh, books on, um, you know, the welfare system. And he was publishing books on, of course, monetary freedom. And, you know, I absorbed everything that he wrote and listened to him very carefully. And so I was very much, of course, as I just said, very, you know, uh, committed to this sort of free market and pulling a radical free market position. Um, but I didn't want to go work in the policy world. So when I moved to Washington, D.C. Um, to go to George Mason, the, the Washington, D.C. area, to go to George Mason for graduate school, my original idea through Senholtz was he tried to set me up to work for the Heritage Foundation as a market, you know, oriented, you know, research assistant to their policy shop. And, you know, I ended up not wanting to do that. And I ended up by working for Don Lavoie as his research assistant. And that kind of changed my whole life because I now saw this academic, you know, life that I could lead, scholarly life, which I wanted to pursue. Um, I had the example of Don Lavoie, but also of Jim Buchanan and Kenneth Boulding. And then uh, eventually Israel Kersner, who I worked with for a decade when I taught at New York University and, um, and, and, and trying to mimic and learn from them. And that became kind of, you know, who I adopted as my, um, you know, role models was Lavoie, a, a woman named Karen Vaughn, uh, Jim Buchanan, Kenneth Boulding, Israel Kersner, Mario Rizzo, who, who worked very closely with me as well when I was a, um, a, a, an assistant professor at NYU. And, uh, and, and, and that's how I approached Austrian economics. So to me, libertarianism is sort of my position about how I see the world. It's my pre-analytic cognitive act. But my passion is Austrian economics, the methodological arguments in Austrian economics, the analytical puzzles within Austrian economics. And yes, of course, the social philosophical implications of Austrian economics. But it's those methodological and analytical things that really excite me. Um, and going all the way back to when I was an undergraduate with Senholtz. Um, and I, I'll just tell a, a funny story with Senholtz. Senholtz had me do some work for him when he became president of FEE. And I was teaching at NYU at the time. And uh, he called me one day. He didn't like the work that I did. And he called me and he says, uh, he has a very heavy German accent. And he says, Peter Betke, you are a disaster. He says, I thought you were a man of action. You are nothing but a man of ideas. He says, if I put you in charge of the seminar at fee, you would run one on epistemology and no one would attend. And, you know, at the time I'm sitting there on the phone, I'm like, 
Dr. Senholtz, I'm not so sure that I'm a disaster. I'm telling you what the outcome of this, uh, you know, study is that I did. Um, but the reality is, is that if I was in charge of the seminar, I would have done one on, you know, Hayek's counter-revolution of science, you know, rather than say Walter Williams on, you know, the state against blacks. As much as I love Walter Williams's book and the criticism of minimum wage, you know, what fascinates me is how is it we economists study social cooperation and division of labor? That's the thing we want to explain. How we explain it is from rational choice theory plus institutions. And that understanding of why, how that intellectual apparatus works, what are the puzzles that it creates? Those are the things that excite me. Um, but I've always been involved in a broader intellectual movement. Um, that broader intellectual movement includes the Foundation for Economic Education. Uh, that was the first organization I was involved with as an undergraduate. I maintained a relationship with Fee for years. I've been on the board of Fee. I've served as a, as a guest editor of the Freeman um, over the years. And, uh, you know, I just benefited so much from Fee. Um, you know, in terms of learning how to uh, argue about the market, reading the the uh, principled uh, positions of someone like Leonard Reed in his book, Anything That's Peaceful, but also Conscience on the Battlefield, uh, which I recommend to everyone. Um, you know, uh, you know, Leonard Reed was just a very effective communicator of ideas that he got from other people. It's, I'm not saying that he was a, a an original thinker, but he was a very effective communicator. At least I found him. If you haven't done so, I really recommend you look at his lecture on YouTube in which he talks about the lamp of liberty and the metaphor that he tries to, to um, you know, invoke in that about self-education, but also the illumination from self-education that spreads to others. I think that is a key to understanding the broader success of an intellectual movement. Um, the Institute for Humane Studies was something that I graduated to from FEE. I worked with Leonard Liggio and Walter Grinder very closely. My wife, Rosemary, worked at the Institute for Humane Studies. I have maintained a relationship again with them throughout my career and have benefited tremendously as a student in their seminars, as a faculty member in their seminars, uh, and, and, and whatnot. And so the Institute for Humane Studies has played a major role in my involvement in, in the broader intellectual movement that wants to defend a free and open society. And then finally, Liberty Fund uh, and the ongoing conversation concerning liberalism that Liberty Fund cultivates and, and, and develops, both with their publishing. I published the Collected Works of Israel Kersner. I was the editor along with my good friend, Fred Sauté, and we did that through Liberty Fund. I now run a reading group for Liberty Fund, which I would recommend to all of you. It's a monthly, you know, book of the month club kind of thing. And then we do, you know, salons where we meet and discuss the book. It's called No Due Date. Um, and I'm the, the curator of that uh, for Liberty Fund. I'm involved in seminars with Liberty Fund and whatnot. So FEE, IHS, and Liberty Fund, besides Grove City College and George Mason University and my uh, years at NYU shaped me um, uh, as an Austrian economist and have made, you know, my life, uh, you know, prepared uh, for my most important job, uh, which is as an educator uh, to young people and in particular as an educator to the next generation of teachers. And so I've supervised, you know, over 40 dissertations. My students teach uh, at, from Brown University uh, to Trinity uh, University in San Antonio, Texas. And I, uh, you know, and, and every place in between, you know, Dickinson College, Grove City College, Hillsdale College, you know, I have students in all these various different places. Um, and I'm just so uh, proud of the accomplishments of my students. Um, but I couldn't have been the kind of teacher that helped those students along had I not um, had the relationships that I had with my teachers, um, you know, again, Senholtz, Lavoy, uh, Karen Vaughn, Jim Buchanan, Kenneth Boulding, and then 
working as, uh, as a as a young assistant professor, learning from Mario Rizzo and, and Israel Kirzner uh, from from 1990 to 1998 at NYU. Um, so I spent a long time with them uh, learning uh, the craft. Um, um, Israel Kirzner is is a role model. Um, I should stress uh, of a gentleman scholar, and 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 I hope that that those of you listening will go and read, uh, you know, some of his his works in here. His most classic pay, uh, book is called Competition and Entrepreneurship, and it was published in 1973. Um, and and uh, so it's, um, you know, it's its 50 year anniversary, and it's, um, you know, just something else, uh, the, the impact of that book. Um, so, you know, my work is not political, um, but it's cultural, historical, and philosophical. And those are the kind of the intellectual culture, the historical and the, the philosophical, analytical kind of approach to the science of liberty. Um, again, it's, it's, it's deeply influenced by uh, Mises and Hayek, but also the philosopher Michael Polanyi um, and Robert Nozick and um, you know, and those those are the kind of individuals that have uh, you know shaken uh, you know my mind when I read them as a young kid, and have uh, shaped my life as an Austrian economist. So, I will have a conversation with anyone who wants to talk to me about any of those uh, those things now. So it's, okay, well we we don't have any questions yet, but let me let me flesh out some of the things that you talked about. Let, let's assume that. People are watching this video who don't know anything about Austrian economics. This is their first exposure. And you did explain that Leonard Reed was the founder of the Foundation for Economic Education, which everybody calls FEE. But you mentioned Bettina Graves. Would you tell us a little bit about who Bettina Graves was? Graves was? Sure. So Bettina B.N. Graves uh, was a basically a program officer at FEE. Um, but before, you know, during that old time, she attended Mises' seminar. And for all the years, Mises taught his seminar at NYU. And she was the one who took, you know, the notes, transcribed the notes. And so at FEE, you can get um, her transcriptions of Mises' lectures on several topics and, and stuff. But Bettina was the contact person when you would, a uh, young person like myself, uh, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old would come to fee. Um, it was Bettina who you talked to about following up and studying further. She published a, a, a two volume reader called the Free Market Reader, which was made up of classic articles from the Freeman. Um, you know, other people had other jobs there. You know, Ed Opitz was the editor of the Freeman. And so, you know, he was busy, you know, uh, uh, or excuse me, Paul Perot was the editor of the Freeman. And so he was involved in that. Ed Opitz was involved with religion and economics. So if you were, you know, interested in those kind of questions. And Bettina was the one who sort of, if you were interested in Mises, you know, you asked her questions about what was going on with Mises' ideas. And, you know, again, when I was, you know, first introduced to Fee, you know, my touchstone was much more Mises and Rothbart than it was Hayek. And Kersner, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't there yet reading Hayek and Kersner. I read The Road to Serfdom and I I wasn't completely excited because I thought he made too many concessions. What at fee, they would have said he leaked. <laughs> Hayek was a <laughs> leaker, right? Uh, Senholtz described Hayek as the John Stuart Mill of the 20th century. That's how he, you know, and, and to him, John Stuart Mill was the great apostate of the classical liberal tradition. So, you know, to me, when I first read Hayek, you know, it wasn't, uh, you know, it's, 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 um, you know, I wasn't so, so blown away. I'll come back to that in a second about how I got blown away by Hayek, but, um, um, so I, I, I didn't really, I only read the economic point of view, Kersner's dissertation when I was an undergraduate, and it's a very dense book. It's not an easy read. And so I didn't walk away from it the same way I walked away from reading Rothbart. So as an 18, 19, 20 year old, I read Mises and I read Rothbart and I read Rothbart religiously. So when I read Four New Liberty, it was 
like an amazing experience for me. And I recommend it still to anyone to this day. Um, I, I, that's the kind of libertarian version of Rothbard that I like for new liberty Rothbard, not later Rothbard, right. That was involved with, uh, politics and stuff, you know, and, and was more, um, you know, paleo. I want the more radical leftist Rothbard of the 1970s. I hope your listeners here know that Rothbard had that side of him, right? So if you read For New Liberty, that's the Rothbard that generated the libertarian movement, not the Rothbard later on uh, that did stuff. And so, um, you know, that was the Rothbard I read as a kid that, that you know, changed my life. Um, and, you know, so Bettina was one of those key people, as was Walter Grinder, um, who was at the Institute for Humane Studies, and Leonard Liggio. Uh, both of whom were just amazingly generous people, all three of them. And when I would, you know, in the old days, you wrote letters. There was no email, right? And I was too intimidated to call any of these people. So you would write letters and then you'd write a letter and you'd wait, you know, for, you know, however long, and then you'd get something back from them and, you know, things like that. And that's the way you corresponded with people back then. Um, even, you know, Murray Rothbart, when I first met him, I had just, you know, two weeks before sent him a copy of a paper that I had written influenced by him. And, um, you know, he was the most charming guy, uh, you know, not standoffish at all. Like you five minutes, you know, him. He's you're calling him Murray. You know, that's like the way he insisted interacting with you. And so I um, I sent him this paper and I was I was very timid when I first met him. And then he looked at my name. And he says to me, he says, ah, he had this funny way of talking. And he goes, hey, he goes, I got a scathing review of your paper sitting on my desk. And I was like, oh, a scathing review. Like, why? <laughs> it's, it's, I said, it was influenced by you. And he, I'll never forget it. He goes, you think so? <laughs> and I go, yeah, it was influenced by you. That's how I wrote it. Uh, but he was just charming and wonderful. And so I got to meet him and obviously, you know, meeting Kersner. Uh, again, I met a lot of these people through fee and through IHS and then eventually through Liberty Fund. So that's how I met, you know, Ron Hamaway was through Liberty Fund. And, you know, I met all those old Austrian, old classical liberals, the students of Hayek from Chicago and the students that were around Mises at NYU, uh, you know, the, that didn't necessarily become academics, but were still involved with fee and I would meet them. And yeah, it was just great. I was very yeah, I as a young person to meet so many dedicated people because when I before I went to graduate school and I was working and reading I was isolated right so you know in fact I probably ruined my wife's experience with uh, Atlas Shrugged because I had read the book before she did and as I you know I was so hungry to have a conversation I kept on asking her did you get to the speech yet did you get to the speech yet you know and she's like Pete it's a thousand page book what the heck? you know and I'm asking her on the first day you know to um, you know do you want to debate with me about these ideas anyway so I, I was just so anxious to have conversations with other people about these ideas and then I eventually found the way where I could have that conversation 24 seven. And I've just been so fortunate uh, to have that opportunity throughout my adult life. It's just amazing. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear you talk like this because, you know, I went to work at Fee for two years. I mean, they had the same impact. I, I wrote an essay called Leonard Reed Changed My Life, but I got to work with Bettina and, and Ed Opitz and Paul Perot for two years there. And it, one of the funniest thing was going into Bettina's office. She had the most disorganized desk I have ever seen. I mean, papers piled on papers. And I went in there one day and I said, hey, Bettina, why don't you straighten out this desk? She says, I know where everything is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah no, she was wonderful. Uh, you know, she's just, just wonderful. Percy, her husband, you know, was uh, also a force in and of himself, you know, and um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that it just, you know, I mean, they were all, you know, pretty old by the time that I came around. So it was kind of like they were older than my, maybe they were the same age as my parents or maybe a little older than my parents. And so it was kind of an interesting like dynamic of a young person 
interacting with these older people. And so they were, I kind of viewed them as, um, you know, like grandfatherly figures, especially Leonard Reed, right? I mean, he really was. And I, I love sitting down and talking to him and hearing his stories. And uh, yeah, yeah, it was something else. Okay, well, we've got a, couple, a few questions here um, from Olivia. Professor Becky, I think you are one of the most complete Austrian economists in academia. We all learn a lot from you on social networks. Thank you for imparting your wisdom there. Two questions. What, well, it's actually, let me give you the first question that there's actually- a, There's the, actually a few more than two, but that's Yeah, okay. yeah, but I think the first question has two parts. What specific position do you have on the use of mathematics and economics? How does it differ from the so-called Rothbardian praxeologists? Okay, I'll, I'll try to be quick on that. Um, but first of all, thank you, Olivia, for that remark. Um, I, I, I appreciate it. Uh, I'm not, um, uh, I don't think of myself in that way. I, I, I think of, you know, Israel Kirzner as, as the, you know, most important current living Austrian economist. And then a bunch of us are all like following and learning in the footsteps. We're students of Kirzner and Hayek and these great economists like Mises and 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 Hayek and Kirzner. Um, on mathematics, it, 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 there's a practical issue, which is that to get a PhD in economics nowadays, you have to know the language of the profession, which means you have to know math and statistics. It would be like as if I wanted to be a French historian, I'd have to know French. So it's just the language in which economists talk. That doesn't answer your question. But it's a reality that any student that wants to pursue an advanced degree in economics has to have some aptitude for math and statistics. If they don't, they could pursue Austrian economics in other walks, but not an economics profession. You could go to law school and be an Austrian economist. You can go to political science department and still be an Austrian economist. But what you can't do is a, be a professional economist. And I wanted to be a professional economist because I wanted to change the way the economics profession does things so that they moved more in the direction of Mises and Hayek and Kirzner. Um, Rothbard's criticism of mathematics. Now, it's important to remember that Rothbard was a math major and a stats major. So he actually understands these things. It's not like he's making stuff up. And, uh, and so Rothbard in Man, Economy, and State has some very cute criticisms of mathematics, basically that they it violates Occam's razor, um, also the issue about discrete unit mathematics versus continuous. So you know, the idea that our functions are smooth and continuous and twice differentiable is different from a society in which we are making discrete choices uh, and, and, and whatnot. But, you know, those arguments didn't persuade other people. But there are arguments that can be used to persuade that that cut against uh, the overuse of mathematics. So the first thing I would say is that mathematics can be a very useful tool, but it's a very terrible master. And most economists treat e uh, math as a master rather than as a tool. So we have to challenge that. Um, I think that, you know, Rothbard's uh, finest statements on the problems of mathematics and economics were written in the 1960s. So at a minimum, we have to update them and adjust them to developments and thinking that have happened since. Um, but ultimately, I think we do too much math in economics. Math and statistics is not economic reasoning. So economic intuition should have a priority over modeling and measuring. Uh, so that makes me a praxeologist in that regard. It's just about the way that we try to communicate that. But I greatly appreciate your comment and your questions. And you have a couple other questions here. She, yeah, she has one other question. Do you have an opinion on what is happening in Argentina with Javier Millet, Austrian economist and libertarian presidential candidate? So I don't know enough to comment intelligently, except that um, the arguments that I've heard him give about the monetary system are arguments that I wouldn't necessarily reject, right? So he, he's it's it's not like he's a politician that is saying nonsense things. 
Now, I don't like the populism stuff. So I have a hesitation of that. And I don't know enough about his full position on things to make a endorsement or a uh, criticism. I just don't know enough. Um, but it's quite fascinating. He's in second place, I think, right now. Is that right? I think this is right. He's in, he came yeah, in he's, second. He, and yeah, he he's in the runoff. In the, and he has a chance in the runoff to maybe, you know, win. Um, I think the media is unfair about free market ideas. So I'm prone to believe that the that they're painting them in the in the worst possible light rather than the best possible light. And uh, so it's be interesting to watch and see. But um, if he wins, I'm going to actually study a lot more and, and try to figure out what he's all up to. Um, that's for sure. OK, and well, and there's a, there's a sort of a long tradition of Austrian economics there. Mises went down there. Uh, oh, in Argentina, there's great people. Esiade. So the first thing I would do is I'd like to, you know, call, which I haven't done yet, but I'd, I'd like to hear what my Argentinian friends say about him. You know, uh, that's what I'd like to do. Um, I wasn't. So to give you a reason why I'm nervous is a lot of my nerves are, are generated by what happened in Brazil. Uh, because a lot of, um, you know, people that I knew in Brazil that were connected to uh, Austrian economics and, and free market ideas uh, were kind of um, excited uh, when the president of Brazil uh, came in, but they didn't fully take into account his kind of populism and, and his own version of statism. And I think that's true in the United States with Trump as well. And I think it's very weird for libertarians to be pro-Trump because Trump is a zero-sum thinker and he is a, uh, he, 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 it's not like he doesn't like big government. <laughs> you know, people should remember is that Trump is the, was the person who shut the U.S. economy down uh, under COVID. It, it wasn't Biden. Biden might have done Trump policies on steroids, but it was Trump who did the original shutting down of the economy. And uh, so, and, he, and he's been, Trump's been preaching since I was a kid that we live in a zero sum world, right? His whole book, The Art of a Deal is all about zero sumness, not about positive sum games of exchange. And so he's, he's not a free trader, uh, not a free immigration. I think classical liberalism is the free mobility of capital and labor throughout the world. And, you know, that's what I would love to see. Yeah. Okay. Leif. As has music influenced your thinking? It's a great question. Um, I uh, grew up a kind of a sporty kid, um, but I uh, also played music <laughs> as a kid, um, and um, and I and I played in 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 you know like punk bands, but as also in uh, you know the the high school uh, and junior high school band until I couldn't do it because I, of the sports conflicts. And then I played sports rather than the band. But my, uh, my son is a musician and, and a professional musician and lives in New York and involved in the, uh, the music promotion uh, industry as well. Um, so I've always tried to, to, to listen to music and learn from music. Um, and in particular, I find uh, certain types of uh, what you might call um, um, you know, sort of strange syncopations. Uh, so unusual patterns I find very attractive to listen to and to learn from about the way that uh, unusual syncopations and the way artists uh, do all of that. I think of that in terms of creativity, uh, combina combinatorial thinking. So, you know, uh, musicians blending music traditions, which previously weren't blended together, I think of as in a great act of entrepreneurship. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I've been a great enjoyer of music. Um, it undoubtedly probably has shaped me because of the emotions that it invokes, um, and the sense of awe of looking at really great artists perform and achieve things that otherwise, you know, humans don't achieve. Um, but, uh, I can't, it's not like I listened to Rush's music and their lyrics made me a libertarian, if, if that's a question that you're asking. I was a libertarian, so I listened to Rush's, you know, songs and I say, oh, that's libertarian or whatever, right? You know, Neil Peart lyrics. Um, 
uh, most music, uh, uh, you know, um, I, I like a lot of um, protest songs, right? That are protesting, especially I, I was the youngest of three kids. So my brother and sister were products of the 60s. I was a product of the 70s. So they grew up and the music in our household was a lot of the 60s anti-war kind of, you know, songs and music. And I, I appreciated it you know, those songs and, and that movement quite a lot. And I, I would love to know where the anti-war left is today. Okay. Brian asks, how old were you when you read Ludwig von Mises' Theory of Money and Credit? And when in your reading timeline did that occur? So I, I should be very honest with you in the sense that I would say that I flick through a lot of these books when I was an undergraduate and didn't fully understand them. So I wasn't smart enough to really understand subtleties of Mises's writings as an undergraduate, but I turned the pages, right? If this makes sense. So I understood Rothbard. So I could read Murray Rothbard's What Has Government Done to Our Money? Or I could read Senholtz's The Age of Inflation. And as an undergraduate, I could say that I could absorb those books and understand them. But if you had me read Mises's, you know, subtle advanced book, it took me until I was in graduate school before I could really appreciate what Mises was arguing in theory of money and credit. But I read it when I was, you know, 19 or 20 years old, right? And, and you know, for the first time. And um, I'm trying to think of the timeline. I probably was 21 because I think that fee... I mean, a uh, Liberty Fund, maybe I was 20. Fee or I, uh, Liberty Fund published the book, I think, in 80, and then published Socialism in 81, or vice versa. And I read those books by as soon as they came out. Uh, they were published by Liberty Fund. We had them in the Grove City Library. I bought them and I and I tried to read them. But I didn't have the same success reading them that I did reading Rothbard. Um, I found them foreboding. And so, you know, if you would have asked me, you know, when I was a, a, a sophomore in college, what do you think of Mises' human action? I would have said, it's the greatest book in the world, and he's a great free market economist, <laughs> right? <laughs> but I, I couldn't have told you, you know, what I could talk to you about the book today. Um, and, uh, and so that's the timeline. Milton Friedman's Free to Choose had a huge impact on me like a like an oversized huge impact on me and that was that book came out when i was 19 and uh i watched the tv series i read the book um i was completely converted uh you know to free market economics uh by milton friedman and then that that you know along with reading all the other stuff senholtz had me reading so it, it's at that level of sophistication that i was ready to absorb as an undergraduate, if that if that makes sense. Okay, uh, Glenn says, is Austrian economics winning or losing in the public space? What can be done to improve its impact? It's a great question. Um, I think it that's a, a it's a kind of a, a subtle question to answer because um, there's probably now more Austrian economists than ever in the history of the school of thought, meaning that people that would self-identify as an Austrian. Even in the economics profession, that's probably true, that we have more people that would self-identify as Austrian economists to others in a way that, you know, but but especially if you include like the entire Bitcoin movement, right? The entire hard money movement, uh, the internet libertarian sort of, you know, world that we live in, the internet Austrian world. Uh, that's out there. There's more people that that say that. At the same time, for the scientific legacy of the Austrian school, uh, there's a uh, this is both a curse and a blessing. So there's a blessing because there's now like more and more people that are reading the works and thinking about it and discussing it on Twitter or on Facebook. Um, but at the same time. Uh, there, it's not the same level of sophistication scientifically that is dealt with by other schools of thought. 
And so there's this kind of strange, tremendous appreciation for the lay applications of Austrian economics and a kind of hesitation because people will make very strong statements on a methodological, on an analytical and an ideological or social philosophical front, which the arguments are not the, the best arguments um, that are out there. So it's a curse and a blessing. Um, and I think if we were a little bit more sophisticated, we would probably be better in the public space, but I might be wrong about that. You know, maybe sometimes, you know, we academics are, you know, too cute for our own good, right? We're too sophisticated. And, and what you need is a blunt force instrument to communicate the ideas across. And so let me give you an example of that, which relates to what I was just saying about Milton Friedman. Let's say that, um, so I'm an Austrian economist. I'm not a Chicago school economist, but if you... And I would argue that the main difference between Chicago and the Austrians are methodological and analytical, not ideological. So methodological and analytical. So I'm talking about Milton Friedman and David Friedman. So, you know, so from classical liberal to radical libertarian. So ideologically, you know, we're not going to have that much of a problem, um, but our problem is going to be methodological and analytical. Um, and uh, so imagine that uh, the government was going to pass, um, you know, a minimum wage law. Who would you rather write the op-ed? Milton Friedman or F.A. Hayek? Right? My, my, my uh, hypothesis is that you'll pick Milton Friedman because Milton Friedman knew how to communicate to a lot broader audience than Hayek did. Uh, even though Hayek's a best-selling author, Hayek writes paragraphs that are pages long. Milton Friedman knew how to write. He knew how to talk on TV. He knew how to smile when he was debating people rather than appear angry. Um, he was a much better representative in the public space for free market ideas than many of our Austrian heroes. Um, that matters. It would be nice if we had a Milton Friedman today. Um, I also, by the way, you know, even though this is slightly cutting against what I just said, but I do think there's also something powerful about people that have convictions. So again, uh, Ayn Rand, when I watch her on the Johnny Carson show, or I watch her on, you know, the Phil Donahue show, or I watch her on Mike Wallace being interviewed, she's unbelievable. Like, you know, she was stuck to her guns. She never shied away. And, you know, she could get the audience eating out of the palm of her hand. It was amazing. Um, we don't have anyone today that has that same kind of power in those same kind of venues, right? That it, that that large of a venue and that kind of an idea. And so when you say, are we advancing in the public space, um, We've had examples of where people have been amazing in the public space. Um, now we don't have any one individual who is as big in the public space um, as Friedman or Ayn Rand, but we have hundreds of people that are smaller, but have a big significant role in the public space. So yeah, I think we're, it's interesting. Uh, great question. Okay. Pat asks, could you please talk about Michael Polanyi's uh, contributions to your work in the Austrian school? So Michael Polanyi wrote several uh, books that your your listeners uh, would benefit from. The, the one most available to them is from Liberty Fund. It's called The Logic of Liberty, um, in which Polanyi's uh, essays are collected. Um, and, and you do that. My personal favorite is his book about science, and it's called Personal Knowledge. Um, and it explains, uh, you know, uh, how it is that science is built on commitments and, of individual scientists and how it's a very human and personal uh, process science. And um, so rather than the idea that, that it's this sort of mechanical, you know, hypothesis testing exercise, it's instead something much different. Um, we, we, we have a tension in science between creativity uh, plausibility and uh, inherent 
you know, sort of interest to the community. And so those the creativity is a, is, a, is a radical force, but the other forces in science are conservative, which is the intrinsic interest of the community and the plausibility of your explanations. But this uh, frames how we all that try to contribute to the scientific literature have to fit into that, that process because that's the way in which the game is played. Um, and so, and it is a game, professional game. We are professionals that are, are, are pursuing it. It is not an amateur science like it was in the 19th century. It is a professional uh, organizational science for good or bad. But for those of us who are trying to influence the economics profession, we have to actually jump both feet into the game. And I think Polanya gives us tremendous self-awareness and understanding of what it means to play that game. On a substantive level, Polanya is one of the better describers of spontaneous order. And so we understand and appreciate spontaneous order. And he was a foundational thinker on the role of science in a free society. Just a little bit of a biography here. Polanya was a leading physical chemist. He actually ran the physical chemistry department at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute when Einstein was at the physics division of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. These are, you know, top scientists, okay? Polanyi saw many of his friends get their lives destroyed by the totalitarian experiences of the 1930s. Both the right, Nazis, and the left, the Soviet communists. And so when he migrated and escaped Europe, uh, well, he escaped Europe, he went to the UK. But when he escaped the totalitarian nightmare, what happened was Polanyi devoted himself to understanding the role of science in a free society. And I think this is such an important pillar of our liberal ideal. I would point to the recent work by Emily Chamley Wright, who's the current president of IHS, and she calls it the four corners of liberalism, economic, political, cultural, and epistemic. That means she means scientific inquiry. And liberalism is all four, right? And, you know, we want free markets. We want the rule of law, right? And the protection of individual rights, right? We need to have open inquiry and freedom of thought. And we need to have toleration in our cultural institutions, right? So that we have toleration of individuals. These four corners of liberalism make up the liberal project. And we need to be exploring each of them. And when we violate any one of them, the system starts to collapse under its own weight. So the metaphor that Emily uses is Imagine that the four corners represent like a suspension bridge in which the relationship between them is the thing that holds up the bridge. The tensions that are in the relationships are what holds the bridge. So if we lose those relationships, let's say that, you know, the cords are snapped. Well, that means the bridge can't be sustained. And so we need to really pay a lot of attention to the liberal project in these four corners and this is, you know, what we're sort of, you know, looking at. Um, I would, you know, let me talk libertarianism a little bit here. Um, so I think Robert Nozick's book, Anarchy, State, and Utopia, is an outstanding book. Um, what I love about the book is actually the economics of the book. So most people focus on the second section of the book in which Nozick develops rights as trumps. So he's going to use rights as a trump on the right and wrong of compulsion by the state. But that's a very small part of the book, actually. The beginning of the book is about invisible hand explanations. And the last part of the book is about invisible hand within communities by competition between communities. That's, that's his notion of utopia, is that we would have all these different competing communities. And as long as no community can impose its will on everyone else, we can allow this freedom uh, to take place among those communities. So that vision, which he laid out again in 1974, that vision is very exciting to me. Um, it's, it's what modern economists call 
functioning, overlapping, competing jurisdictions. Um, it pushes, you know, federalism even farther than competitive federalism, right? It pushes decentralization in a most extreme form. So I'm very excited about that and, and whatnot. And so among modern thinkers, uh, Chandran Kukathos's The Liberal Archipelago is one of my favorite books um, to communicate what the radical liberal vision is um, and, and, and building on that. And so it's like taking the chapter in the Constitution of Liberty, uh, the creative forces of a free civilization, and then applying it to government in addition to the uh, to applying it to the entrepreneurship that takes place within the market, which is what that chapter is all about. How about we apply it to the very structures of government itself? And then we can see how those are all going to work out. Um, that to me is a very, very exciting message. And it comes right out of our tradition. It's using the analytics methodology, methodological individualism and market process analysis to then in fuel and uh, embolden the kind of radical liberalism, true radical liberalism uh, of a free society, a society that strives to be neither discriminatory nor do uh, exercise domination, that doesn't allow privileges. Um, that's the kind of vision of a free society that I would like to communicate to people and get them get my my students working on to promote uh in their work and explore yeah okay we, we we're about out of time but let me just ask you one final question before you go you've mentioned ihs uh, the institute for humane studies would you just give a little a short summary for people that have never heard of ihs uh, new people to the movement what what its founding connection was to fee the foundation for economic education yeah. and what its mission is that's awesome. Thank you. Uh, so uh, Baldy Harper was a professor at Cornell, and uh, he used the road to serfdom in his uh, MBA class. And the dean told him he couldn't use the book uh, to teach. And uh, Baldy Harper said, I think you don't understand, you know, what a tenure professor can do. <laughs> right. I'm a, I'm a tenured professor and I, you know, I, I, I want to use this book in the class and I believe in academic freedom. And the dean, you know, said, no, no, you can't do that. And so Baldy Harper left to go to fee and he became a program officer at fee. Leonard Reed recruited him. Um, he wrote some fantastic little pamphlets and stuff at fee. Uh, one of which is called, uh, you know, uh, uh, about, uh, uh, you know, do unions raise your wages and, you know, these kind of things like that. Anyway, so Baldy Harper was at Fee for, for many years, but the, the what attracted him to Fee was a promise that Leonard made that they were going to create a kind of um, basically institute for advanced studies, uh, but for free market ideas. And so Baldy had this idea that he was going to go there. They were going to have this research center and maybe a graduate school uh, that was associated with it. Um, and then Leonard, uh, you know, basically changed his mind and that wasn't what they were going to do. And so with seed money from the Volcker Fund in the early 1960s, Harper founded the Institute for Humane Studies. And the Institute for Humane Studies was was basically based in three kind of important ideas, which was Austrian economics, anarchist political thought, and natural rights, legal theory, natural law, legal theory. And so early on, the Institute for Humane Studies became basically, in, in a lot of ways, the home of Murray Rothbard. Right, because Institute for Humane Studies was founded in the early 1960s. Rothbard's Man, Economy, and State was published in the early, you know, 1960s. Um, it's a it's a comprehensive textbook of economics. Uh, eventually, he would publish Power and Market um, and other kinds of books uh, that were all associated with these kind of ideas. And again, like I said, for New Liberty. And and Baldy Harper was very supportive and, and promoting of Rothbard's work. Um, but again, he also supported Mises and Hayek 
the, the Constitution of Liberty came out in the early 60s around the same time here. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so IHS was a group that tried to identify the next generation of thought leaders that would empower Hayek's intellectuals and socialism, the answer to what Hayek wanted in intellectuals and socialism. And so IHS was very involved in, you know, as Hayek puts it, making the the quest for a philosophical foundations for a free society once more a live and exciting intellectual program that would attract the best and the brightest among us. And IHS was really focused on doing that from its founding to today. So, yeah. Okay. Pete, I can't thank you enough. I mean, your presentation today is just the epitome of what we had in mind when we put this thing together. Kind of a personal insight, personal impact, along with the really important principles and books that influenced your life. Thank you so much. It's just absolutely well, fantastic. I, I can't thank you enough, Bumper, for what you're doing uh, to keep this conversation alive. Uh, the uh, lectures that you have put on videotape and the book that goes along with that by Professor Richard Ebeling are just phenomenal. Um, and I use them in my undergraduate classes and my graduate classes, uh, because in many times, Eveling is saying things that I could never say even better, right? So I just rely on letting Richard, you know, make the explanation of some of these ideas. And so what you've done in, with the resources over the years and everything is just phenomenal. So uh, thank you. And uh, I'm very happy to to try to be here and communicate. But my life in Austrian economics has been very fortunate. And one of the great fortunes is that I get to meet and talk to people like you uh, over the years. <laughs> and so um, it's been uh, it's been just amazing. And I hope I have many, many, many more years. Uh, my my closest friend in graduate school is retiring. And and I was in shock that he was retiring. And I said, so we're at that retirement age now. And I told him, I want to work for another 20 years. And he said, <laughs> of course you do, uh, right? Because I, I can't imagine like doing the retiring thing because I just want to keep, keep, you know, around these ideas and doing it. And I think that that's because of the great fortune that I've had to be able to interact with, with wonderful people like yourself and others that care about liberty and advancing the intellectual case for liberty. Well, thank you. Uh, it means a lot coming from you. And you're one of my real life heroes, especially in Austrian economics. So it's a nice compliment. And I feel the same way you do. I, I can't imagine retiring. I just love what I do in my life. I just uh, love this thing. Um, next week, we got the great Joe Salerno, another Austrian star. Those of you that are familiar with the Ludwig von Mises Institute know about Joe Salerno's work. You're not going to want to miss it. Another great presentation. Pete, thank you very much again, and thank you all for tuning in. We'll look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much.